Tonight on Nation to Nation, Finance Minister Christian Freeland tables the Liberal government's first NDP-backed federal budget. It delivers a $4 billion Indigenous housing boost and another $4 billion for Jordan's principal. The second highest area of spending is reconciliation. Over the fiscal framework, second highest reconciliation. In the past, individual residential school survivors have been compensated for their suffering. But what about reparations at the band level? An ongoing lawsuit seeks just that, and the Liberals are proposing to fight it. It's to seek compensation that would allow them to control the, the not them, but the bands themselves, to control how the money is spent to recover and revitalize language and culture. Earlier this week, the United Nations issued a damning climate change report it says countries need to stop investing in fossil fuels to avoid climate catastrophe. That's something Chief Judy Wilson agrees with. It's madness to increase the tar sand emissions. It's madness to continue what we're doing to Mother Earth. Hello, I'm Brett Forster and welcome to Nation to Nation. We begin with a breakdown of the 2022-2023 federal budget. This year's spending plan focuses on affordability and growing the economy. For Indigenous people, the big ticket item is $11 billion in new money for housing and child welfare, among other things. APTN's Lindsay Richardson was in the lockup today. She joins me in studio with the details. Uh, hello, Lindsay. Thanks for being here. Hi, Brett. Thanks for having me. Federal Budget Day, it's kind of like the Super Bowl on Parliament Hill. What were your overarching impressions of the spending plan? Well, let me preface this by saying that I'm by no means a financial expert, but as someone who's been following this news cycle, you know, closely over the last three years, I could say right off the bat that there were a lot of fires for Canada to put out here, mitigating ongoing effects of COVID-19, at least two multi-million, even billion dollar settlements on Indigenous issues. You know, there is a lot of ground to cover. So I found that the budget did cover those points. How substantially they're investing in each of those areas is another question. But Chris Sheffield, during her press conference, did specify that even though everybody seems to be talking about housing initiatives, green economy was the number one priority for the Canadian government, and second up was reconciliation. Mm -hmm. What are some key pledges to Indigenous communities on that front that stood out to you in the budget? What marked me the most, I think, is how the government is addressing the unraveling of the residential school's legacy moving forward. So not just the number of measures, but the variety of measures. So there are investments to sort of help the searches keep going. There are investments uh, to better commemorate these sites. There's an investment for an oversight uh, person in Justice Canada to revise federal laws to make it legally more possible to protect these sites. There's investments for digitization of federal documents. There's investments to compel the RCMP to collaborate on community-based initiatives and searches of these sites. So it, it, that was an interesting nugget for me because it basically demonstrates that once these searches are completed, it's not a, as we say in French, a fait accompli. There is a process to continue and they seem to be making a vested effort in wanting to, you know, really enshrine this period of history with respect respect and dignity and healing for mm -hmm. the people involved. A lot going on there. Uh, one thing that wasn't in the budget was the $40 billion for child welfare reform and compensation of the victims. Were you able to get a sense of when and where that money is going to come from? Yeah, definitely a big ticket investment. So we did speak to a financial expert at the budget lockup and it was explained to us that that investment was accounted for during the fall economic settlement. So there was basically earlier announcements invested before December. So that's already accounted for. Everything that was introduced as part of today's budget comes on top of that. But if we're asking how this is going to be paid out, in what amount, and in what timeline, we couldn't get answers on that. It seems like it's still a bit of a touch and go process. Mm -hmm. Now, the budget's first chapter is about housing and affordability. These have always been long-standing challenges, especially for remote and northern communities. Can you give me a sense of what the government's overarching plan is on that issue? Well, they're calling it the most ambitious housing plan that's ever been tabled in Canada. And most of the initiatives, simply put, are trying to make the market more uh, accessible for first-time home buyers. Uh, there are investments for creation of co-op homes, for example. Uh, but the point that people seem to be focusing on the most here is Canada's promise to actually institute a moratorium on foreign buyers 
buying up real estate here in Canada, basically giving people the opportunity to actually access the available houses here. So that was quite interesting, and whether or not that is going to be possible to institute, you know, we've got experts already debating that point, even, you know, Brown now a couple of hours after the budget was tabled. And more than half uh, Indigenous people now reside off reserve anyway, so we stand to uh, you know benefit or not from these measures as well. Uh, but I want to switch gears a little bit. Uh, the budget comes on the heels of a dire warning from the UN about the climate crisis. What's in the budget with respect to the climate emergency? Well, Freeland was very clear in outlining that this is an existential issue. This is something that we have been living with for a while and we will continue to live with in the future. So Canada at this juncture sure she says has a choice to make we can either be at the forefront of green economy and the green transition or we can lag behind so with regards to indigenous communities there are a few investments that basically will create indigenous advisory groups or councils to sort of hear their concerns and find out where this money needs to be Rediverted essentially. Mm -hmm. And there's always the need to balance, uh, you know, the climate crisis with resource extraction and the demand for fossil fuel projects. Where does that kind of factor into the budget? So this was outlined. We've identified the problem of climate change and the need to switch to green economy. But one thing that's needed is what the federal government is calling critical minerals. So things that can supplement, you know, fossil fuels or other less ideal products that we are currently using. So the budget document specifies that a lot of these minerals are located near or in First Nations territory. So again, creating sort of an advisory council, how can we uh, access these minerals and how can these First Nations communities also profit from whatever revenue is generated moving forward. A very interesting point in the budget, apparently there is an upcoming plan that we can keep an eye open for involving First Nations input on the Line 3 mm -hmm. and the Trans Mountain Pipeline projects. They acknowledge that these are going to be billion dollar cash cows. So there is a plan in place to make sure that First Nations are given a cut of those proceeds and the details are still to come. All right, I've got about 15 seconds left. So was there anything missing from the budget? Was there anything that appeared to be left out? You know, between this year and last year, were more than $20 billion of new money. Well, there, unlike last year, there was not a dedicated section tackling issues that were identified in the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry. Uh, we also didn't see a whole lot about prison reform and addressing the overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples in the budget. But like I said when I opened, there was a lot to deal with. There will be a lot to deal with moving forward. This is just one budget, and we'll see what else is still to come. All right, Lindsay, thanks a lot, and great work on this. Thank you so much for having me. You can find more of Lindsay's reporting at aptnnews.ca. After the break, I'll speak with a lawyer representing two First Nations who are seeking residential school reparations in court. Welcome back. Should Canada have to pay reparations for the loss of language and culture caused by residential schools? Two BC First Nations say yes. They filed a class action lawsuit against the federal government seeking compensation at the band level. It's scheduled for trial this September, and the Trudeau Liberals are preparing to fight it. John Kingman Phillips is counsel for the plaintiffs. He joins me now to discuss the case. Uh, welcome, Mr. Phillips. Morning, Brett. First, what makes this lawsuit different from the ones that have already been settled so far? So the class action that is now before the court is one of the last excluded groups of co compensable survivors from Indian residential schools. To date, the compensations have, that have been paid have been for individuals, for individuals' losses. The bands Kamloops and Seychelles, supported by the James Bay Cree in this case, are seeking compensation at the band level, as you pointed out at the beginning, and it is for the collective harm to the language and culture that's been occasioned by the Indian residential school policy. These harms have never been compensated before at the band level, and the objective of our clients, the, the three bands, Kamloops, Seychelles, and again, the James Bay Cree, is to seek compensation that would allow them to control the the, the, not them, but the bands themselves to control how the money is spent to recover and revitalize language and culture, rather than letting Canada dictate how that happens, which is the existing model that, that is at present right now. 
In fact, it was the model that led to the Indian residential school policy to start with, that Canada thought it knew better. It's up to the bands to decide how to fix their languages and culture. That's, that's the point that's being made in the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. I suppose this is the big question. Why is the federal government fighting this claim despite settling with uh, the other ones? Well, that's what we don't understand. I mean, it, you'd have to ask the minister and, and Prime Minister Trudeau why, why it is that they're going to defend this. The fact that Indian uh, Aboriginal peoples have the right to language and culture generally uh, is what the legal question is in the fall at trial and whether that's a compensable loss. And frankly, the way this government's approached the other compensatory programs that they've gone into with resident, residential schools, combined, for example, with the apology from the Vatican, uh, it should be, frankly, a, a matter of fact that the bands would need to be compensated, would need to be put back at the position they would have been if they hadn't had schools and a curriculum with English and uh, religious education imposed upon them for two or three generations. So, I don't know. Well, let me uh, reframe my question a little bit then. Uh, what is the federal government arguing? What are they saying in their court filings to fend off these allegations? Well, they, they pay lip service to the idea of, of reconciliation, but fundamentally deny that the bands themselves, the First Nations, have a right, a general right to language and culture, or that any loss of that language and culture is compensable, that, that is, could be compensated by, by damages, um, or even have a right to it. Mm -hmm. Well, the political landscape has recently shifted a little bit with the Liberals and NDP forming an alliance. How do you foresee that impacting the case? Well, I'm frankly horrified if, if we want to go into a trial in September with, with the federal liberals supported by the NDP taking the position that the First Nations do not have a legal right, a constitutional right to their own languages and cultures. Um, it surprises me if they maintain that position, and I'm hoping that we do have an active dialogue and get to a resolution. And, and again, Brett, the resolution that we're seeking in this whole process is that the bands would be put in a position where they could revitalize their own languages and cultures at their, as they see fit, not as Canada sees fit, and not dictated by Canadian policy, but dictated by local concerns and local interest and, and love for their own languages and cultures at the band level. While residential schools operated for more than 160 years, uh, cultural assimilation was their goal. In fact, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has said that, recon or that, pardon me, that residential schools were a central element of the Canadian government's policy of cultural genocide. Uh, how do you calculate the cash value for that level of loss? Well, and I think if you ask any of our, our band's representatives, they would tell you that's in incalculable, the loss of language and culture. To have that taken away but one of the the metrics that could be employed is the imposition of a language or sorry of a curriculum in a school and a schoolhouse and a teacher for two generations if you want to compensate for that replace that give the aboriginal communities a, their the equivalent of a school a teacher and a curriculum for two generations and they can try to correct it and they can own the outcome that frankly is one of the it's the most effective models otherwise there's calculation of damages to the additional costs that have been occasioned to the to the communities in dealing with the the fallout from residential schools whether it's it's domestic violence um issues on on reserve lack of loss of ability to of governance or participation in governance but the easiest metric is to replace what was taken away to, to put back a school a curriculum and and a teachers for two generations for every community. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a dollar figure in mind or there's no uh, sum attached to the lawsuit that uh, you're seeking you know, to get as, as reparations? We haven't got, gotten into that detail yet, but the, the metric that I'm talking about I think is the one that would, would be most effective. And finally, uh, how many bands have joined so far? Uh, you mentioned three off the top. Uh, and what's your message to other bands weighing whether to opt in? Well, so th there's three bands that are now in, two representative plaintiffs supported by the James Bay Cree. Uh, we have, uh, in the first period of certification, we had 103 or 101 bands op opt into the process. Canada has agreed and the court has ordered that we reopen the ability for other bands, all the bands in Canada, to opt in to the proceeding as represented plaintiffs. They don't have to pay anything. 
they can participate in the outcome if, if we're successful at that trial on liability in September. And frankly, what we're seeking, my, my clients, are control over their own process of revitalization of language and culture and a, and, and a determination that they have a right to that and a right not to have had that destroyed by Canada. So on behalf of my clients, I would encourage every band that meets the definition that has had a person who attended residential school or who had a residential school on or near their territory to opt into this proceeding. All right, Mr. Phillips, we have to leave it there. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Brett. Have a good morning. After another break, I'll have reaction from Chief Judy Wilson to the UN's latest assessment of the climate crisis. Welcome back. The world's top climate scientists have issued governments an ultimatum. If they want to stave off climate catastrophe, it's now or never. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, issued its latest report this week urging world leaders to halt fossil fuel development, slash carbon emissions, and shift to green energy. For a reaction, I'm joined now by Kukpi Judy Wilson. She is the Secretary Treasurer of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Welcome to the show. Hi, welcome. Yeah, thank you for the welcome. So tell me, what about this week's report struck you as important? Well, it's, we we're hearing the same thing from the scientists and the uh, community about, you know, slashing emissions and also, you know, reducing uh, what we're doing in the oil and gas uh, uh, field, especially the tar sand, right? So, you know, like emissions in, in Canada, when I was at Glasgow, they said, you know, it's continuing to increase. So, you know, the report isn't uh, surprising to me and countries like Canada have huge per capita emissions and, you uh, Canada's plan to reduce emissions are too high and uh, too slow. So, you know, you know, the scientists are measuring all these things, you know, they're watching these things and we have to pay attention to these reports, especially uh, in the fossil fuel sector where carbon capture and storage is being proposed uh, to explain a way how this country will produce oil every year. So, you know, I think, you know, we have to pay attention to that. People have to understand that, you know, climate crisis is real in BC, we had, a lot of climate crisis events last year. We had the uh, wildfires, we had the heat dome, and we had global uh, the warming that got, you know the, with the atmospheric rivers. We had four of them, which is unprecedented. I wanted to ask you about some of those events in BC. It's really seemed almost like a ground zero for the climate emergency. How concerning is it to hear scientists predict these events may worsen in the future if we don't act now? Our, our First Nation communities are on the front line of this because we're, you know, near the forest, near, near the rivers and all of those things, you know, some are remote and uh, some are still in crisis right now as we're speaking, uh, trying to recover their communities. Uh, you know, Lytton was burnt down, you know, that Trudeau cited that over at Glasgow and, you know, uh, some of the communities uh, neighboring Lytton, you know, they were affected drastically. So from the wildfires and uh, one of the neighboring bands to mine, the Okanagan Indian Band, had 10 houses burnt down. You know, if the wind blew uh, over the mountain this way, it would have been us. But the wind blew the other way and uh, burnt, you know, their community down. And uh, the atmospheric rivers, it uh, um, was that disastrous to our highway, our, our main artery, Trans-Canada Highway. It pretty much closed everything off from the lower mainland. Uh, Abbotsford area near Vancouver was totally flooded out and the uh, rivers uh, collapsed the bridges and the highways. So we just sort of had them open. They're open now, but, uh, you know, it was really challenging for a while. And there's still a lot of cleanup from the debris. I, I drove through it. It was really terrible. And then uh, just the weather is so unpredictable with the uh, climate crisis. So like I'm saying, we're experiencing it firsthand here. We had just about every type of climate crisis you can think of in British Columbia, uh, you know, and, um, you know, except for one thing, but I want to say it so we don't jinx ourselves out here. But, uh, you know, we've we've had just about everything you can think of in BC. Well, I'd like to uh, get your response to something the head of the UN said when introducing uh, this report. He spoke in pretty uh, bleak terms. I'd like to get your response to something he said. Climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals. 
But the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. Investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure is moral and economic madness. So he says it's moral and economic madness. Uh, what do you make of those comments given the political debates here in Canada over fossil fuel development and activism? Well, it's, it's to me, as I mentioned, it's not a fringe radical position to be talking about winding down the fossil fuel sector. Uh, that's basically what he's saying. Uh, it's not, it's madness to increase the tar sand emissions. It's madness to continue what we're doing to Mother Earth. Uh, the major transition in the energy sector is necessary. It's not optional. And Canada committed and signed up to make these reductions. So major transition, it doesn't look like uh, locking in new supply of fossil fuels by building new pipelines and expanding production. And I, I believe that's also what he's saying. That's the madness to continue the expansion or the, you know, refinancing of the Trans Mountain Pipeline or, you know, the fracking, because, you know, we're going the wrong way uh, with fracking. You know, uh, California, they, they're banning it. And in Oregon and Washington State, they have, they're working on their bans, but BC, we're increasing it. So that's the madness he's talking about. And trying to uh, continue with tar sand oil is as simple as he said. I, I really like the way he framed it. Now, politically, do you think the new alliance between the federal liberals and NDP will create the will to act? Well, I think all parties are accountable. Uh, you know, what kind of government do we have when they're going, you know, increasing emissions? So whether NDP is signing a sweetheart deal with the Trudeau government, they're still accountable. Uh, we have to be able to go the other way and reduce the uh, emissions. And uh, Minister Bill Bo, I think last month or a month and a half ago, he, he did state that we're going in the wrong direction. I actually, for the first time, supported a minister <laughs> saying, yeah, we're going in the wrong direction because we're increasing uh, fossil fuels. We have to go in the other direction. So uh, for for once, I actually agreed with uh, what Minister Bobo was saying. He got a lot of criticism from the uh, what we call petro uh, companies, the petro uh, government uh, type thing we were saying no that you know he he is right uh, he must have read these reports and other reports so he's he's saying the right thing when he's saying we're going in the wrong direction we need to reduce emissions and we need to look at sustainable development and sustainable uh, energy and uh, heating for our ourselves and communities there are the technology is there it's just a, you know, we instead of investing billions of dollars, 21 billion in the Trans Mountain Pipeline, imagine if we invested that in, you know, clean energy and uh, better uh, solutions that doesn't harm the earth or continue the emissions. Uh, that would have been a, a better investment than uh, the government going in the wrong direction and putting 21 million billion dollars of uh, public dollars into a pipeline that's a stranded asset. Okay, uh, Cook B. Wilson, unfortunately we have to leave it there. I appreciate you taking the time. Okay, thank you. And that's all the time we have for you tonight on Nation to Nation. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Brett Forster. I'll see you next week, and thanks for watching.